Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. I almost couldn't say it just then. Tom Ray's Art Podcast. Boom. There you go. While I'm on that subject, don't forget to go to TomRay'sWebsite.com if this is the first time you're hearing the show. You can go there to subscribe to the podcast. You can check out my daily webcomic. You can check out my blog where I talk about the things that I do throughout the week. Basically, I've been running my own business and doing pop culture and vintage items here, selling those online. I don't know. I do other things there. For some reason, all of a sudden, I blanked out completely. So go to TomRay'sWebsite.com. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about my guest today, which is a person who lives... Uh, not too far from where I live in Madison, and their background is uh, in the tech industry. The person is an artist who started painting six years ago, it, which is pretty impressive. The The stuff that uh, they put out is, is pretty cool for someone who just started six years ago. Uh, and the other thing is that they also run a honey business, making honey, selling honey, 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 honey. Huh, and it's called Vanda Honey, and the, uh, the so you can go check that out at, at vandahoney.com, and then also uh, the painting and artwork and everything is at judyrob.com, and also on top of it, so we get into a lot of really strange tangents that all still have to do with something, but part of the background that the person has is um, that she met. Uh, what's the person's name? I'll say, Rusty Dennis. Rusty Dennis, who is the character that Cher played in the movie The Mask with Eric Stoltz, met met her while she was going to California for uh, doing photography or a documentary or something for a biker magazine. So that's part of this very interesting conversation. R- huge background on this person's artwork to technology to what they did. And just she kind of goes hey, we should try this or do that. It's fun. Great conversation. So here's my interview with Judy Robb on Tom Ray's Art Podcast starting right now. Judy Robb. I am a artist, a technologist, beekeeper. Let me get, you said technologist. So please explain that to me because I have my, my head has its own assumption as to what that is, but I'd like to know what you mean by technologist. Well, I, um, I, I worked for a very large technology company Oh. and I, uh, I was a UX director, creative director, and I traveled all over the world. Um, so I I was I I like to think of it as doing odd jobs for a very large technology company, but it seems like you know I've I've been doing odd jobs all my life. So. Yeah. Um, I can tell you about some of the detail there, but then I went back to school and got my master's in computer science and human computer interaction. Nice. So it was kind of cool because I've always been an artist and I've always liked. Technology, you know, I was kind of a, a kind of a geek when you know internet started to happen, and I was always an artist, and I always have been a social anthropologist as well. And um, I wanted to go back to school in something with computer science, but I was like, oh, I don't want to be just a programmer or somebody, you know, that's writing Java or um, you know doing working in databases. So I was living in Chicago at the time. And I was looking around at um, you know universities there, and I found at DePaul University human computer interaction, which is computer science, psychology, and design all in one. Because what human computer interaction is is how people interact with systems. Yeah. Or or a phone, or a visual display, or you know everything that is proliferated now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, when I found this program, I was like, oh my God, that's it. That's that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. And I went, you know, I worked full time and went to school full time and uh, got out. And I loved it. And uh, then I started working for this very large technology company. And I traveled all over the world and worked for amazing companies and had a lot of really great experiences. So you're someone that I would have worked with. I had to... I had to... 
I was the liaison between UI development and graphic design and the back end developers. I was the front end developer. I was I was uh, the guy that had to make the way I used to describe it is I'm the guy that made it like the color blue. You know, I was <laughs> I was the guy that had to connect those parts, but make it look like it was supposed to. And I used to work with uh, UI development. And that's the funny thing. The interaction that you're talking about. It's literally the same as uh, why people know when there are three dashes at the top that that's where the menu is. It, right, there's nothing right. that says that it's a menu, but somehow it's been that that's been decided. That's what this is. That's it, in, in usability in the old Jacob Nielsen terms. It's, it would be referred to as the user's mental model. Mm -hmm. So you know that's why you know everything you see on the web, people just know, or on their phone, they just know that a hamburger menu means click that if you want to see more of what's on that particular site. Yeah. So it's interesting. I was just talking to um, someone about Jacob Nielsen, who who he and Don Norman were like the fathers of usability, and they developed very very early on. I think in the, I want to say earlier than the 80s, the 10 heuristics of usability. Mm -hmm. which are still very tried and true now. Um, every one of them applies. And uh, it, it's like nothing has changed really other than how they in the tools that they're applied to. So it, it, we all expect a good experience when we go to a device or a site. You know, if you don't find what you want within two seconds, you're out of there. Mm -hmm. It used to be three seconds. It was four seconds. Now it's like, you know, if you don't find what you want within two seconds, and that's probably a stretch. Yeah. You're out of there. Yeah, or if it takes you more than one click to get there, it's like you're making the person do work to get to the thing you want them to see or yeah. all, all yeah. that kind of thing. Wow, this is this is fascinating. I did not expect to geek out with a honey farmer. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, Mr. Vandahoney is more of the beekeeper. I, uh, you know, I dabble in it with him, but he's like the hands-on. Oh, really? Uh, Operations guy, I like to refer to him as COO, whereas I'm CMO, but it's just a two person and all the bees, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, and and it's funny too. So CMO, you're saying chief marketing. So you're the marketing right, person. Right. So, and right. that's funny because going back to what you said about the laws of interaction and UI and all that type of stuff, and it really hasn't changed. Same thing with marketing. It's the same reason that uh, a lot of the times they'll give you the whole Dale Carnegie, you know, how to meet people. I don't even remember the name of it, but I know that everybody promotes that and it's the, like the building blocks and then other people have their different versions, but it comes from the same interactive skills. It's still human nature. It evolves over time, but there's still the basic instinct of what the human nature is, regardless of how it, you know, it, it's evolved over time. It still comes from the same wanting to connect with someone like that's the right. important thing is connecting exactly. with people. Connecting with people and, you know, thinking, you made me think of something that, you know, Andy Warhol and pop art, it means point of purchase. I didn't know so that. That's where it came from. Yeah. Point of purchase. So, you know, think about it. I mean, point of purchase displays have been around forever. I yeah. mean, you know, forever. Um, there's, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago, there's always been point of purchase wherever you've been, not that I was around 500 years ago. Well, maybe I was, I don't know. But <laughs> She's a witch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. You know, I love the history of, of art and technology and, and to see how they've kind of evolved together. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm a history buff and, uh, you know, things like that pop art thing. When I tell people that little thing, they're like, oh my God, that totally makes sense. Well, and it's funny because it evolved to the point of purchase is then the operating system that people use where it's no longer the interaction with the person. It's the person checking you out or, right. you know, checking out. And that's called a POS, which is funny because that could also stand for another acronym, a piece of, hey, um, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's point of, uh, a point of sale. And you're saying right. point of purchase. And that's, wow, that's really funny. And and that's true. Again, the interaction, it used to be the point of purchase was there were tricks and methods that you didn't know about, like on the shelf that would go, you're going to buy these here. You're looking for tomatoes, but you're going to buy these tomatoes or you're going to buy, yeah. you know, something that's going to make you like little tricks that make you go, oh, I, I need to reach forward and grab there. 
to, to right. get that. Or, or if you're in line at the grocery store and you're okay with the line being a little long because you can read the National Enquirer. Mm -hmm. while you're <laughs> yeah, like why are those always there instead of like in the magazine rack or yeah. Right. Right. Never would buy one, but no. who buys them? I used to buy them because uh, I like to cut out the pictures of the weirder articles to put on flyers for the band, the punk rock bands I was in in high school. <laughs> so oh my we, God, that's funny. <laughs> so we you always know, used to use them for that. I was in the National Enquirer once. What's that? I was in the National Enquirer once. What for? I was working in a bar. I was young. You know, I was like, you know, early 20s, starving artist type. Okay. Um, and... It was, I was living out in Chicago, and this guy came in, and he said, hey, I'm with the National Enquirer. All right. Would you mind if I, if I took a picture of your big toe? And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Are you sure you were in the National Enquirer? <laughs> okay, so, so it gets better. So, right. so I, went, I said, sure, you know. So I had somebody watch the bar, and I went out, and he, I put my foot up on a, a car, and he took a picture of it, my toe. And then he asked me a few questions, and la, 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 la. And then, sure enough, a uh, couple months later, there's my picture and a blurb about me and my toe. And then my poor mother, she called me, and she said, I was at a funeral, and someone said they saw your picture in the National Enquirer. <laughs> First of all, none of this sounded above board. I mean, what kind of safety rules did you have when you were working? Sure, I'll go out in the parking lot with a stranger. And <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That's how they find those stupid stories. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the headline was something like, what the heck? It's just a toe. Uh-huh. <laughs> now I want to know, like, did he have the story ahead of time? Was he coming up with the idea? Is it just something he's like, I'm going to try this and see if I can I sell know. it? I don't remember all that. You know, I just remember my poor mother being horrified. Yeah. You know, I've, that I've done other things in my life that have been more horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's a fantastic story. I love that. <laughs> but I didn't ever expect to be telling that one today. Yeah, no, I did. I had no background on it, so I'm glad you mentioned it. I I had no idea. I didn't. I didn't do that deep dive of a search on you. <laughs> yeah, out to yeah, find that okay. out. That's fantastic. Oh wow. So okay. So back to all right. You're you're the chief marketing officer. Let, let's start out first with before we start talking about your artwork. Um, you do sell honey. You uh, you have a company. Vanda Van Honey. Honey. Tell, Van tell me Honey. about how that actually got started. Well, um, my husband was looking for something to do, Mr. Vanda Honey. And I said, you are not going to just, and I was, you know, I was working. Mm -hmm. I said, you're not going to just uh, lay around the house and watch Dr. Phil all day. <laughs> so I said, why don't you, you know, become a beekeeper? We live out here. We're really into the gardening. And it'd be kind of cool, you know, da 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 da. So he went to take a class, and uh, it, that's how it started. You, why, why was Beekeeper the first? Like, why did you have that one locked and loaded? I, think I saw, uh, I read an article about it, and I saw there was a class. Oh, okay. And I said, why don't you go to this? And um, I even took a picture of him that day. He had his notebook, and a, I packed him a little lunch, and off he went. And off Did you race. post it to Facebook like first day of school pictures? <laughs> I think it's probably out there somewhere. But um, then, uh, so I, you know, we started to do the honey thing. And I said, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to sell it. And we're going to brand it. And we're going to be really cool. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what do you want to call it? And he said, how about Vanda Honey? And the way he came up with the name, I, I don't know if you've ever watched Seinfeld. Yes. Or sign reruns, but they had a fake company called Vandalay Industries. Oh yeah. So he said, "Well, how about Vanda Honey?" And I was like, "Perfect." So I was like, "That's it." You know. I would never have guessed that in a million years. That's really good. Idea. So I uh, trademarked the name. I created the LLC. You know, I did all of that. Bought the domain, and here we are. Yeah. It <laughs> And that's the, that's, that's really, I mean, that proves that you are 
the chief marketing officer right there. And the, on top of it, it that explains a lot too. Cause I was going to ask you questions about, uh, your setup on the web and having your technical background that that's very handy. It's a good thing to have. It's very handy. And, uh, so I also, you know, in my past life, I was a photographer. That's where I, you know, before I went to graduate school, really, I, I did a lot of photography and I worked in, I lived in Chicago and I worked for some, you know, relatively popular, famous, whatever you want to call it, studio photographers. Yeah. And um, I, I did a lot of black and white printing. And that, so I kind of learned that art. And I working in the studios, I work, knew, work, learned a lot about uh, light and shadow and, you know, just photography in general and uh, in film, film photography. Mm -hmm. So those were great skills to have. So I just became like a master printmaker of black and white photos. And uh, I really liked it. You know, I just loved the black and white and have the, I still have all my old Nikons. And um, so I, you know, worked for these photographers and then I um, met this one photographer and he and I wrote a book together and it was a documentary about motorcyclists. Oh, okay. We, we did some, he did portraits in his studio and then I did some candids on the road and then I wrote, stories and it was it's called road pirates you can still find it you know really cheap on the internet okay but well that was kind of fun wow so you know and so i i uh did that and uh did odd jobs photography you know like you do when you're a starving artist mm -hmm. um and those were some of the best years of my life i've got to say yeah. when i was a starving artist well they are now we <laughs> <laughs> weren't at the time they were so you know that's how I started kind of I always was an artsy person and the, the you know the, the photography and the documentary kind of thing was the way of me bringing in that social anthropology yeah so I've always been really interested in people's stories hmm. and uh, I, and I think as you go through your life your everything you do kind of influences your art and evolves uh, you know your art evolves your way of thinking evolves Totally. Um, all of your experiences that you've had. Uh, and it's really interesting when I think about how my photography has evolved. And now, for me, photography is kind of more of a tool. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like taking photos, you know, in the winter. I like doing a little video. Um, I'm really into my trail cameras now because we, we have bobcats that live up behind our house. Do you really? Yeah, they're they're right here. They, I mean, right in the backyard we see them. Oh wow! It's amazing. We're only like thirty minutes from west of Madison, so huh. that's pretty exciting. So you know, I'll set up my trail camera and then I'll you know I'll be looking through like hundred and twenty videos on the camera, and then all of a sudden a bobcat will come in and it's like woohoo! Like you hit the the jackpot, <laughs> you know, or a nice big buck, white tail buck, or you know, just really cool stuff so I like playing around with the trail camera videos yeah and so you know everything's evolved and now it's like nature and um, you know using photography to kind of influence my oil painting now and do you mainly paint in oil or what what is your I, I, I paint in oil and uh, I don't really deviate from that I'm not a watercolorist that's just too delicate for me I'm mm -hmm. kind of like a you know, balls out kind of person. Yeah. And uh, I do dabble in a little paper mache, but it's very time consuming. So yeah. I've only done a few things. I, I did a, a huge paper mache of a buck, a big buck that kind of looks a little bit more like a moose with uh, white tailed deer antlers. But to do that, see, that's the thing that confuses me about paper mache. You have to have something to put it on to create that shape. So, like, how are you starting off? Like, to do a buck, like, tell what. How did you start that? Just out of okay, curiosity. So I, had no, I had no knowledge of paper mache, but I, I admired some paper mache and I thought, oh, wow, you know, that'd be kind of cool. Uh -huh. So I, uh, first of all, I took a big piece of, uh, like, you know, a big piece of pine that I used as my foundation. And then I, then I took balloons and I put them together, just like you would think, you know, uh, the head. And then I added another balloon, and I used a lot of tape. And then I used like uh, paper towel rolls for uh, you know the the cardboard in the side of the paper towel. Okay. 
and I used that to kind of piece together the antlers. So I started with that foundation of, of the balloons, the tape, the paper towel rolls, toilet paper rolls, whatever, to kind of build that <laughs> up. And, uh, you know, then taped it all and kind of shaped it. Um, and then I just got down into it with the paper mache, and with newspaper and um, flour, water, and some glue. I, so I kind of experimented with it. Did you take at least a picture of the, uh, I guess, what would be the skeleton or the base? Like, because it sounds crazy. Like paper mache and balloons and pine. <laughs> well, yeah, and it it, it turned it's it's really big, and um, Mr. Van Dehoney calls it bullwinkle because uh -huh. it's now it's it was so heavy, and I painted it, and then I put some old um, costume jewelry on it, and <laughs> of course and you it did. Started, it, we were moving it, and it started to fall off the base, so I have to do some repair on it. But it's in his shop, and he's like, when is Bullwinkle getting out of my shop? I, I really... And you're like, it's yours so, now. That's where it lives. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, I, that's one of my – I've got to fix that thing. But that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But, I, yeah, I think I'm more of a painter. And, uh, you know, a lot of things influence it, my art. Yeah, like what? Like, what you uh, – I know – it seems that it's very similar to the photography is it it's a lot of out, more outdoors sort of stuff, but it's also portraits. And yeah, I'm curious to know like where, what your inspiration is for what you're making. Well, um, it, it, I go through phases as most artists do. Um, so I really am a fan of Tudor history, you know, uh, late, um, 15th century, 16th century tutors like Henry VIII and his six wives. I'm just fascinated by that. And the the elaborate, uh, you know, clothing that they wore and mm -hmm. the crazy lives they lived. I mean, the guy had some of his wives ex executed or he, you know, put them out to pasture in exile somewhere and, right. um, you know, just did whatever he wanted. And... The, the stories are just really interesting to me. And um, so that kind of influences, like this one I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. I started out with this as Anne of Cleves. This is a work in progress. But I think it's she's too pretty to be Anne of Cleves, I've decided. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because Henry VIII, when Anne of Cleves, I think she was his third wife. Don't quote me on that. But, you know, it was an arranged marriage. She came from Germany from Cleves, uh -huh. and when he got when she got there, he was like, I am so disappointed. Pretty much, you know, like insulted her. Yeah. And uh, so she, you know, he, he said she's just not good looking enough. So <laughs> he was kind of brutal. But anyway, that, that really inspires me. With the stuff that you just said before that, with the painting behind you and finding out about the, like, do you have an interest in history, a background in history? Like, uh, not, not that well, you shouldn't be doing this if you're, I mean, if you're, Painting something from history, of course, you want to know about it. But it, well, it, what brings you to it? I got my undergrad in Madison, and I studied a lot of art history. I, and I wish I had been an art history major, but I ended up being a political science major, which really means nothing to you know. But um, I really liked the art history, and I had this art history professor at one time, and you know, he would he would talk about these portraits, and I think this really had an influence on me. He would show like a portrait, um, you know, from like this period or you know the 18th century or something, and mm -hmm. and it would show like the three quarter portrait of someone, and it would always have a background of like the sea or a castle, and he, you know he described that as outward show of inward grace, meaning you know that you're doing the painting the they would do the painting of someone, but they wanted to show their wealth and their consequence in the okay. background of the painting. So that term, that phrase, outward show of inward grace, really resonated with me. It would be a good album title, too. Outward show of inward grace. It would be, it would be totally. Um, I don't know why. It just sounds like something, like some 90s British band would name their album that, like their debut album. 
Uh, or even a name for a band. Yeah, maybe. It's a bit wordy <laughs> for a name of a band. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I like, I like how we're discussing this like completely just made up scenario that I just created. It's like, you what would be better? You know what band I really like is It's a Beautiful Day. Have you ever heard of that band? They were from no. the 60s, like total um, hippie San Francisco. And they, they do a song called White Bird. And the name oh. of the band is It's a Beautiful Day. And I've never they're, heard of they're that. Big hit, you know, they were like a one hit San Francisco band, White Bird. Yeah. Take a note of it and listen to it. You'll probably like it. All right. I'll take a, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll try and see if I can hunt that one down. But is, so you were doing the history. You, you, you like what type of stuff did you start out painting? What, what, uh, like how did you originally start out when you were like painting stuff? Well, you know, I haven't really been painting that long, probably okay. maybe like six years. And oh, wow. I, you know, I evolved to it. My grandmother was an oil painter, and I have a, a lot of her paintings. And she was a landscape painter. Um, and I think I just, one day I just went and bought some oil paints and some canvas, and I started painting, and I really liked it. Yeah. And I found myself like getting lost in it. And uh, so the time I spend in my studio, so now I, I'm in my studio in my basement of our house, and I just, it's like a new, you know, part of the holy evolution I was talking about of your art. So mm -hmm. it's another medium for me, but I think it's one that I really enjoy. Um, am I the greatest painter in the world? No. Um, you know, I have good ones and bad ones, like any artist would probably say. But you know, I I uh, I wouldn't call myself a plein air painter by any means. Like I like being in the studio, but if I want to paint outside in the summer or something, I will. But mm -hmm. the light changes so much; it's difficult. It's a good point. You got to work quickly. It's true. I actually like the fact that you will get an idea and you're like, like there are several stories you've told me now where you're like, why don't you do this? And then you do it. I kind of like that. <laughs> you're like, yeah. why don't you be a beekeeper? And then next day, you, well, not next day, but I'm sure. But it, then he was a beekeeper. And then you're like, one day I just picked up, decided to do that, you know, the, the painting. And yeah. Right. I, right. So, you know, it's, um, I, I, like I said at the beginning, I like to make things. Yeah. Um, like, like in the last month, we've made two batches of venison sausage, bratwurst. And I did, you know, I did the, all the research to, because we, we are archers. We, we, we hunt for deer with our bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. And um, venison is really good. It's very lean. Um, but we like to use everything on the deer. So I, um, I said, oh, let's try to make some, you know, venison bratwurst you know I did a, so I did a little research did some reading and I uh, had this old wine fridge that we converted into a curing chamber because you've got to let like salami or sausage or anything you let it cure for a few days at a certain temperature and humidity so you know you make your batch up of meat and spices and whatnot and then you stuff them into the hog casings and then you put them in this curing chamber for three days and then into a smoker. And so we were like, oh, I wonder how they're going to be, you know. And we, so we got through the, like, the five, six-day process and had brats that night. And we were both like true Wisconsinites, right? You right. Know? These are the best brats I've ever had in my life because it was like, we knew every ingredient that was in there. Uh -huh. You know, a lot of it came from like the garlic from our garden, this, you know, some of the herbs and the deer that we harvested ourselves. And and there was no crap in there, you know, mm -hmm. like you buy. You don't know what you're getting in a sausage, right? right? So that was really satisfying and, and they're really, really good. Wow. So, you know, that was that was kind of a winter chore. So now we're set for our summer. And um, I'm hoping sa Saturday it's supposed to be really nice out to fire up the little fire pit and cook up some brats outside. I hope it is. And and also I want to. I was trying to remember when you said you were taking trail photography and everything. I want to say you and I have had discussions. I, I think it was you on Instagram about your 
like of winter and my dislike of winter. I think we've just, I, I think we've talked about that a few times on Instagram. <laughs> well, that's interesting. You know, I I'm really looking forward to spring because this was a really rough winter. Yeah. I mean, um, the bees didn't do that great, so you know we don't know exactly what's going on. But you know, we have a wood stove and we like to use that. But you know, we also have a furnace to augment that. But I don't know. This was a really challenging one. I don't want to talk about the weather too much, but hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I don't either. I just, I, it, that occurred to me. And I think it was you. There may have been one other person who also really enjoys winter. I can't remember, but I, I know that you were talking before about the winter. And I just, it's one of those things. I've never liked winter, but yet I've lived here my whole life. Like I have no one to blame but myself. So right, I just, right. I just complain about it. Um, but I did live in LA for a year when I was a starving artist. Oh, you did? Why I, did you end up there? I missed, I missed the four seasons. So people I was, tell me that, and I call BS on that one. No, no, I did. It was like June, and I'm like, "What's going on here?" You know. But, so I stayed there for a year. I lived right in downtown LA with some artists, and uh, that was a very fun time. What kind of experience was that like? I mean, it, you went there, and then. Only a year. Like, did were you hoping to achieve something there, or you just just no. were like nice place to visit? I can tell you the story. It's okay, story. do it. So when I was when I was working on the motorcycle documentary, I went out with some friends to a motorcycle rally in South Dakota. Okay, Sturgis, I'm assuming. Yeah, Sturgis, and uh, we were. You know, there was this woman reading tarot cards, and one of my friends said. That's Rusty from Mask. The re that's the real Rus Rusty. Oh. So Mask, the movie with Cher. But this was the real Rusty. Okay. So she was reading tarot cards. So I was like, I'm gonna have her read my tarot cards. First so of all, that's like, fantastic. Like, like you literally yeah. met Rusty from Mask. That's that's. Oh yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Doesn't look anything like Cher, but uh, right. A lovely person in her own way, but. So she reads my tarot cards and she says, you're going to come visit me in Los Angeles. And I said, what? I'm not ever going to Los Angeles, you know, like a true. I was living in Chicago at the time. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I'm at the motorcycle rally. We, we, we met, we, me and my friends met this, this old hippie guy that rode um, a BMW and he had a Stig sidecar on it. And it was the craziest thing. I mean, I took photos of him, of course, and he's in the book. And he said, you know, Judy, why don't you fly to Albuquerque and I'll meet you there and then we can go in the sidecar, the, my bike and sidecar to Los Angeles. And I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. And we went to Rusty's house. Huh. And she was right. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? So it that's is. how I ended up in LA, and I actually lived with her for about a month. Come on now. I am not kidding. She lived in the valley. <laughs> she lived in the valley, and I lived with her for like a month, and I met these artists, and then eventually went to LA and lived in this warehouse with all these artists, where pretty much where the 10 and 5 highways, freeways meet. Okay. That was fun, you know, was, had a blast there. Great experience. Um, worked for a motorcycle magazine, doing pho photography. Uh, a magazine owned by Larry Flint. Actually. Okay, I was going to say a legit motorcycle magazine or a motorcycle yeah. themed magazine. No, it was a motorcycle themed magazine that was owned by Flint, Larry Flint. He owned a, a lot of magazines. Right. But that was kind of fun. So that you know, kind of paid for my beer and tacos. <laughs> uh, <you know. laughs> <laughs> of course it did. Yeah, yeah. So that was really fun. Um, yeah, Rusty, she was interesting. She taught me how to read tarot cards. I've always wondered uh, about that. I've even talked to people who make tarot cards, and I've never really thought to ask, like, what's the concept behind them? Well, it's it's it, if you you can read tarot cards with a deck of playing cards. The con the 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 it's very similar to a deck of playing cards, but okay. so the. The minor, there's the minor arcana and the major arcana. The minor arcana kind of mirrors the four suits of a deck of playing cards. Okay. 
So that's kind of interesting. And then there's these major arcana cards that are like, you know, the world or or death or, uh, you know, the, the hermit, things like that. Huh. Yeah, so she taught me how to read tarot cards, and she worked uh, on a 1-800 tarot card line. That's how she of made course. her money. Yeah. And she, you know, she still lived the being, you know, that movie thing and everything. You know, that was her persona. She didn't work for the Dionne Warwick tarot card line or psychic card line, did she? I don't know. I don't remember all that detail, but uh, she, she was really good at it. Huh. Um, it was kind of crazy how good she was at it. And she, wow. that's where I learned to read tarot cards. So I've done that here and there. Really? <laughs> like you've gone in, like you've set up shop in a booth or something somewhere and done that? I have. In fact, before the, the COVID pandemic plague, in, I um, the Spring Green General store, I read tarot cards a couple Sundays in the winter there. How do you approach minutes, somebody to do that? Well, we were selling, we were, we would sell our honey in the Spring Green General store. Oh, okay. She's there, one of our vendors. Yeah. And, um, you know, she was like, I'm always, you know, and I got to know Karen, the woman that owns it owns the store. She's like, I'm always looking for things in the winter because, you know, spring green, American players theater, you know, there's a lot of traffic, but come winter, it's like, you right. know, out, out in the country. And I said, well, how about if we did uh, tarot card readings, $10 for 10 bucks for 10 minutes. Well, so the first time we did it, we, I only did it like three times before the plague hit. Mm -hmm. We were booked. I was like, booked. wow. Yes. We started at like noon and three till three o'clock, and it was like bam, bam, bam. Ten minutes. I would. I didn't get a break. I, <laughs> it was so crazy. I mean, and then and afterwards, I was just like this. Oh my god, Carl. <laughs> I said I'm a charlatan. You know, these people just. It's like people love that stuff. Yeah. Even if it's just you're you're just giving them a bunch of smoke and mirrors. But I mean, sometimes you know. I, you know, it's like they, being that social anthropologist. You kind of just can feel things with people. Mm -hmm. I get so that. that. Yeah. So I attribute my tarot card reading skills to Rusty. Huh. <laughs> well, and to build off of that a little bit too. So you had set up shop in this place. Actually, I am kind of curious, like before this happened, or before the plague as you referred to it, which I kind of like that, the... Uh, you were you had a store that you were putting your honey in and um like finding places to do your artwork and things like how were you how were you putting yourself out there how were you finding places to physically put the stuff that you make including the honey okay so for the honey uh our website and you know being the technologist search engine optimization is great yeah um, because they found me and then I, oh. we also sell our honey at Tel San Tea in Mount Horeb, and that's how they found us. And then we have the online store. Um, and then, you know, we were doing honey tastings at the Spring Green General Store before the plague. Um, and then before the holidays, we would have, like, little open houses here at Vanda Honey on the weekends. Uh, but obviously we didn't do that this year. Right. But, you know, now it's kind of word of mouth, and we're very small batch. You know, it's we're not, like, a big operation you know our honey is raw and we don't heat it or filter it you know you might get a piece of bee wing in there and you know people like that the, okay. you, know, the, you know if you're a foodie you know if, there, if there's still like propolis and wax and i mean that's all really good for you so when you know really? they heat it filter it yeah when they heat it and filter it it loses a lot of the um nutritional value okay so we're purists with that regard yeah so with my art, I, uh, you know, again, kind of word of mouth. I've do, I do a few little commissions. Um, I'm a member of the Mount Horror of Arts Association, and uh, we're, get, we're planning our spring art tour, which is June 4th, 5th, and 6th of this year. Okay. And that is Western Dane County, um, you know, the Mount Hora, Black Earth, um, Verona, Middleton, you know, all the little towns around the western suburbs. And it's literally an art tour for three days where artists open up their studios 
and people have, have a map and they can go follow and traverse through the beautiful Driftless area where you know where we live mm -hmm. and visit people's studios. So I, I think we're going to be moving forward with it this year. I'm planning to do all of mine outside, hopefully. That's you what know. I was going to say. I'm wondering if like a lot of people are going to set up outside, but you know, weather. So there's, you never know right. what's going to happen that way. Yeah. And Mr. Vandahani said, well, you know, we can always clean out the garage really well and yeah. we'll have, we, and we have a tent. And so I think it's going to work out just fine. So we're really looking forward to that. So June 4th, 5th and 6th, everyone take a little trip. If you're a Madison or Southern Wisconsin person, you know, it's a nice opportunity to get out of town and go on a nice little uh, country ride. Yeah. No, I may actually take you up on that. I've, yeah, I'd like to sure. check that out. That'd be, yeah. and also, I want to see your crazy bee set up. Um. Yeah, it is crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. I, I get stung and I sometimes get bad reactions. So I Really? Yeah. I, I mean, it's at the point now where, you know, I, we have a lot of garden activity here and it's at the point where, you know, every day you get stung. It's like, oh, I just got stung. And then you just carry on, you know. Or sometimes, you know, if they really get you, it will be like, oh, it got me really good. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, they get pretty aggressive, like if it gets really hot out. And, mm. you know, if you go into the hive, they can get really, really angry. Okay. So, and literally, like, it will be on the four-wheeler. They will chase you down the trail. So it's like, you know, get out of here. Not for me. Oh yeah, man. Everybody. Oh, and, and the, uh, so you were talking about search engine optimization and stuff like that before. Now I know, uh, from looking at your site, uh, you have a WordPress site and you have, you're using WooCommerce for your, for your cart, right? Yeah. WooCommerce, um, which, uh, works pretty well. You know, it's like with WordPress, it's, it's, it's not something you can just read and do. It's right. a lot of trial and error. I mean, so you've got to, you've got to really be in there and and working on it. And um, I mean, it's really nice. WordPress has really evolved. I mean, yeah. plugins. You know, are you, you know, hosting your own version or are you using their version? Like, are you using their hosted version or are you doing it on your own server? I do it on my own server. Okay. Well, I I have a sir. I you know I I have a hosting provider and then I right you know do everything. But I'm a I'm I would consider myself a WordPress developer. I don't do the drag and drop. Right. I mean, it's too limiting for me. The plugins are great. I mean, I struggled with a shipping thing a couple years ago. I mean, I, I like spent hours trying to work with just the shipping thing, and then I was like. Oh my gosh! I'm just gonna buy a plugin for seventy dollars, and then I was done in like a half hour. I was like, "Oh my gosh! Why didn't I do this two years ago?" What was the shipping difficulty? Well, I was just trying to do different weights and uh, different shipping areas, zones, and things. Yeah. And I mean, the 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 you know the out of box, we'll call it WordPress, only lets you do so much. Right. Um, so I was like, when I bought the plugin, I was like, oh my God, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so now it's like uh, plugins. Yeah. Yeah. For what, if you're looking for, you know, spend the 20 bucks. My... <laughs> right. <laughs> but I still dabble in technology. Um, I'm working out with a, a little startup team. Um, oh. a former colleague of mine, a data scientist. Uh, who's working on an assignment in Sydney right now? Um, it, we're working on a, on a uh, community first platform. Really? Called so Socio Profit. Okay. Socio Profit, like prophesize profit. So it's um, going to be uh, like a, you know, kind of a Bill of Rights kind of community where rather than like Facebook where you give somebody a friend or a like or a heart or it's more like uh, of the people by the people and it's going to be for for geeks um, you know it's going to be artificial intelligence data science social news um, collaboration sharing of computing you mean like a uh, platform it's a platform yeah so we're, we're in the midst of the startup on that so I've been dabbling with that so that's kind of fun huh yeah, so that's my little startup thing with my 
my colleagues. So we're just getting, you know, I'm not a data scientist, but it's pretty interesting. Yeah. And the artificial intelligence and everything that you can do. So, you know, I think uh, we're all a little tired of fake news. And mm -hmm. I mean, not to sound like anyone, but I think everyone, that resonates with everyone. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, it's, it, this is going to be about, you know, collaboration and uh, value of what people's opinions are on what's good and what's not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of the people, by the people. Well, here's, so here's a question that actually kind of relates to a lot of the stuff that you're doing with these ideas and you're building stuff that actually uh, takes some either other people or physical objects or something like this. How are you, how are you funding these things? Like including the, the, so the platform that you're talking about, or like starting the B company, like how are, how are you creating these? I guess it, that's what I really want to know. Like if I wanted to start something tomorrow, like I thought of an idea, like what would you, if you thought of it, what would be your method for, for starting it up? Well, if, if I, with any small business, I would say, you know, you've got to have a, a, a job of some sort to, you know, set aside some funds for it. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been a saver. I've, you know, when I was working for the large technology company, I'll give you an example. I, um, you know, I worked with a lot of men, <laughs> technology. Yeah. Um, and they were always like, oh, you know, they have screen savers of their, their BMW or their Porsche or their Tesla or their Mercedes. And I'm like, I'm not spending my money on that. Right. I'm driving an old car because I'm saving my money because I want to get out of here. I don't want to be working for this company, you know, for the rest of my life. So I want to save my money. So that would be a big thing that if I would tell someone to do is to save your money. Mm -hmm. If you want to start a business, put some money aside for it. Um, whatever that business is, you know, whether it's like butcher, baker, candlestick maker. I mean – Save some money for it and be thrifty and, you know, be wise about what you spend your money on because, uh, you know, like, you know, they say how there's that curve of anticipation, that curve of when someone goes, they're like, oh, I really want to get that Tesla, mm. you know, and it's like, oh, gosh, you know, I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm designing and I'm designing it and, you know, it's I'm going to be picking it up next week. Do, 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 do. They pick it up and then it's like, hmm. Okay, now I got a car payment and the thrill is gone. Right. Or you know anything, the new iPhone, you know. Do, 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 do. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then it's just cool. So um, that would be my best advice: okay. is be thrifty, save your money, um, start small. Don't you know? Make a list of what your priorities are. Um, do your research. How did you find the people that you worked with on this platform that you're talking about? Well, we're just getting started. Um, I, the one guy that I worked with at the large technology company reached out to me because he mm. knew I was like, you know, hanging out, being a gardener and an artist. Yeah. And he, it was like, I got a text in the middle of the night, you know, cause he's in Australia. Oh. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I need to talk to you. Da, 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 da. So, um, that was like last fall. So we're a startup. Nobody's getting paid. Right. You know? So it's, it's, it's us also being aware that you're not going to get paid for a while and you're going to have to put time into something that you're not going to make any money on right. and you may never make any money on it, but nothing ventured, nothing gained and not to sound cliche, but mm -hmm. I think that, that's kind of the way it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And here's another weird thing that just occurred to me that I meant to ask earlier. Um, the jars for your honey are very stuff. Where do you get your jars from? How do you get jar? Like, like you have stylized jars for your honey. Where are you getting those? Um, the, the, the actual glass jar. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I look around at different vendors and our, you know, our brand has evolved. Um, so I found a vendor, and I we've we've been using the same jars for the last two or three years, um, and I really like them. So we now we only have two sizes, and then yeah. we have a cream honey that has a little honey pot that's kind of cute. Um, that's the one I saw that one, yeah. Yeah, 
So it, it evolved, and now we're kind of happy with where it is. Um, our brand it has evolved. That's another interesting thing. So I, you know, being the history buff that I am, I found this uh, like 17th century uh, woodcut print through the British Science Museum of, and they don't know who who originally did it. Is that what that is? Know, it's of a like a, a you know a monk, not a monk, but a you know like a a vicar, I'll call him. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, by a beehive eating, you know, a chunk of comb, and I, and the, the actual, the original is a lot bigger, and it's got a Latin phrase that goes with it, um, and then there's, you know, some more elaborate stuff. But I, kind of, you know, I got permission to use it, and I, I stylized it and cleaned it up, and yeah, well, that's our Vanda Honey brand now. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't know that that was brand new. I just saw that recently. I thought it just kind of popped up for me finally, but. We've been using it for about three or four years now. Oh, okay. That, okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I, w- I was like, I swear I've seen it before. <laughs> I thought like yeah. you just did it. And I'm like, am I imagining no, it? No, okay. Okay, sure. cool. No, I like that. I didn't know that that's how you found that. I thought I was I was actually going to ask you about that. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot. <laughs> yeah, and because no one really knows who created it. Some people think it's Dutch. Some people think it's English. Uh you know, it's, maybe at some point someone will come after me and say, hey, you can't use that on your honey jar. You know? I hope they say it in that voice particularly. <laughs> Literally, someone walks in and goes, hey. So, uh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that, that's kind of fun. Yeah, the bees are cool. I mean, it's nice to have them around. And We have different you know, viewpoints on that one. <laughs> the honey um. You know, we built. We have a, a following. We have. I have one customer that he only wants like the honey that's like two years old and totally crystallized. Really, he loves it. It's like he'll call me and he'll be like, "I want the thickest, gooeyest, oldest honey you've got." So I always, you know, save some from the previous year for him because you know we usually sell out every year because, like I said, we're small batch. Yeah, know? that's really cool. We're not going to become millionaires on honey. <laughs> I, I get that. We have some hives over at the neighbors and, hmm. uh, you know, it gives everybody something to talk about here in the valley, you know, right. about the country where everybody gossips and talks about you. And, you know, you may not know them, but they sure know you. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. And I've, uh, what, so one more question for you is, is, uh, is there anything, so you'd mentioned the art walk that was happening before, but there, are there any other sort of projects or things that you have coming up or artwork that you're working on you'd like to tell people about before we sign off today? Well, um, you know, I've, like I was saying, I've, I've evolved with my art and I, over the winter, I was doing a lot of limited palette over the last year. And then oh. Uh, now I'm starting to do a little, adding a little more color, and I've been I've been kind of on a bird kick lately. Yeah. So you know, with uh, with Anne of Cleves, the pretty Anne of Cleves here. Yeah. We're adding some birds to it, um, but um, you know, I'm. I last summer I was paint. I went outside and I was painting some a flower out in my garden, and I've like, I'm bagging this. I just don't like painting flowers. Yeah, and I I said you know what I just don't like painting flowers. I said to a friend of mine, and they were like, "Well, you know that's that's the way it goes." I said, "I'm just not. It's just not me." So I really like something that has a little more life to it. So, and I like kind of telling a story with it. Yeah. So my goal is for this to be finished because it's it's full length and you can't see the whole thing. But I'm I, for the spring art tour. Uh, in June, I want to hang it outside, like hang it in the trees. Yeah. Last year, this art tour was canceled. So I did a drive-by art thing where I hung a whole bunch of paintings in the woods along the road, and I kind of advertised it just on social media. Oh. And I actually had some drive-bys, you know. I was like, I kind of promoted it as, you know, enjoy some art from the comfort and safety of your car. Right. Um, so, you know, we hung stuff up, uh, and it looked pretty cool. I had, there's a tree down by the road that I just got out my ladder and I hung paintings of birds and big, big paintings that I had. Um, and it was, it looked pretty impressive. And then I had all the Native Americans on posts as you, you know, so it was, it was kind of cool. 
Nice. So I um, definitely, I think I'm going to do that again at some point over the summer, uh, the drive-by art, because I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. Now, even as a concept, even if it wasn't the reason that you had done it, 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 it like the entire concept still seems cool regardless. I like, I like the idea in general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I read about it, uh, a place in, um, I read about it in the New York times, a, a place in Long Island, a little community that did that. They had like, you know, an artist community and they did the drive by art when the pandemic started. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's awesome. That's what I'm going to do that weekend of the spring art tour because it's been canceled. Right. So we're hoping that it's going on this year. So that's, that's kind of exciting. I hope so you know? too, and I hope to I hope to stop by for that. Yeah, for sure. We're gonna have some um, tea and um, honey mocktails. Of course. So, um, <laughs> so there'll be refreshments. Yeah. And uh, and I think it'll be fun, and I think it's an opportunity to go see a variety of art because there, it, you know, I think there's about thirty artists in it, and everyone's oh, different. Nice. You know. That's it, cool. It's it's. it's Everybody's got their own style. So that's kind of what makes it unique. And if people wanted to check out your stuff, where do you suggest that they go look for it? Well, Vanda Honey is vandahoney.com. And then my, you can see my artwork at judyrob.com. There you go. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so glad we finally got a chance to meet. Well, Tom, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.